Good morning to one and all present. On behalf of MIT Institute of International Studies, I, Priya Gautam, welcome you all to the third day of Vijay Gishu 2021. Today we will start with the technical session number four of the e-conference on the theme Asia Pacific and Security Perspective. I am profusely elated to take an opportunity to introduce our distinguished chair for the session, Dr. Gurgur Dhar James. Dr. James is the Honorary Director at Sarojini Naidu Center for Women's Studies and Associate Professor, Department of Political Science and Coordinator, Masters in Human Rights Program at Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. She has been the Visiting Faculty, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She has designed she has designed, taught, and evaluated a postgraduate course in comparative political analysis. Dr. James participated in the interactive dialogue with special rapporteur, general debate on protection and promotion of all human rights, civil, political, economical, social, and cultural, including the right to development at the human at the United Nations Human Rights Council, Geneva, held on 14th and 15th of March 2011. Dr. James has numerous research publications to her credit on topics ranging from gender and empowerment, government, governance and political economy, human rights and African studies. Dr. James is a postdoctoral Fulbright Fellow in Global Political Economy and is also a fellow with Charles Wallace Trust, United Kingdom. Welcome you, ma'am. Now, I would extend warm welcome to our presenters for this session. Mr. Nimesh Babu Oli, researcher, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. Dr. Sania Abdullah, political scientist, Center for International Security and Cooperation, Stanford University. Mr. Jyotishman Bhagwati, research scholar, Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. Dr. Swasti Rao, Assistant Professor, Aligarh Muslim University. Dr. Kuvar Alkendra Pratap Singh, Assistant Professor, Institute of Science, Banaras Hindu University. Dr. Malcolm Davis, Senior Analyst, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, Canberra. Mr. Akash Sahu, Researcher, Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. Ms. Sarbajit Kaur, Research Scholar, MIT University, Uttar Pradesh, and Dr. Aditi Priya, Assistant Professor, Manipal University, Jaipur. We welcome you all. And scholars who have joined us through Zoom and are watching this live on Facebook and YouTube, we are extremely glad to witness your presence today. Now, without further ado, Dr. Bulbuldhar, ma'am, I would kindly request you to take the session forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ria. And uh, thank you, Professor Nagalakshmi, uh, Professor Bindra, and everybody, all the distinguished uh, uh, panelists that we have with us. I can see they're, you know, they have amazing potential. And this is a very, very crucial area of concern. And uh, I really want to congratulate Amity for you know, University for taking this forth, because we are living in times from a globally you know, dominant kind of traditional understanding of security, uh, uh, you know, post-war situation, Cold War situation, characterized by a focus on military priorities, uh, protecting sovereignty to today where there's non-military threats, you know, global pandemic, climate change, energy, AI. So I'm really looking forward to the, you know, kind of papers that we have. And uh, it is a very contested terrain um, and it's constantly evolving. So they are going to be dynamic. And from a very, from a global perspective, you know, that traditional understanding is going to be questioned. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, hearing about what is non-traditional security? What is, how is our understanding of security changed over a period of time? What are the dominant non-traditional security challenges? And I can see from the topics that have been shared with me that, uh, you know, uh, you're going to uh, present here. We have artificial intelligence. So Nimesh is going to present on artificial intelligence. And then we have strategic cooperation by Sanya. And uh, uh, then the swing states, which is being spoken about and very, very contemporary with the Quad Summit on now. And uh, then mapping India, very interesting 
collaborative paper in terms of the quad collaboration, which is, uh, it's interesting that they're talking about quad colla collaboration, and this is a collaborative paper here as well. And another one by Akash also on the quad and internal dynamics of it. So I look forward to it. We have a total of, I think, till 11 a.m. So we're looking at presentations. Um, since we have um, uh, presentations which are seven here. So um, I'm looking at about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes of the presentation, if you're going to upload it and all of that. 15 minutes, is that right, uh, Professor Nagalakshmi? And perfect. we are going it's to leave the rest fine. of the time, we are going to leave the rest of the time for Q&A because yours are very, very provocative topics and we're really expecting a dynamic discussion. So I'm Definitely. going to invite, as the order of the sequence sent to me, uh, Nimesh Babu, uh, to present his uh, paper. Over to you. Uh, dear organizers, uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Yeah, just a second. Uh, IT, please uh, give the uh, sharing rights. Oh, yeah, now I can do it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So good morning, everyone. I'm Nimesh Babuli. Uh, I work as a research associate at NICE. Um, I'm a computer engineering graduate and working in the areas where international relations and technology uh, can be bridged. I'm working on that. So I want to thank organizers, uh, MIT University, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, and all the participants who are present over here, and our respected chair and co-chair too. So uh, today I will be covering um, the areas where artificial intelligence has a, is having a profound impact in the change in the power dynamics all around the world. I, I will be focused majorly in the Asia Pacific region, as my topic suggests. Uh, then I will go towards the aspects of um, artificial intelligence and its relation to the power dynamics in different front. Uh, then I will describe them in brief. Uh, then later I'll summarize my whole presentation. So artificial intelligence is uh, basically, uh, it utilizes machines and their programming through which it executes tasks that our human mind is only able to solve. And uh, the utilization and implementation of artificial intelligence has skyrocketed over the years. And I think it is not a common phenomenon now is we are all familiar uh, with, the, with the prospects and developments of artificial intelligence. Uh, AI is a broad term and it includes a lot of other areas as well, like machine learning, natural language processing, semantic technology, robotics, computer vision. And uh, without any doubt, um, uh, this technology is, uh, is uh, set to become the powerful means for uh, political, military, and economic superiority. So the gravitas of artificial intelligence can be seen when we uh, listen to our world leaders as well. When you listen to Vladimir Putin, he says that artificial intelligence is the future not only for Russia, but for all humankind. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. He stated this back in 2017. And Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has also talked about artificial intelligence where he is a little bit uh, uh, curious and he is uh, concerned with the use of artificial intelligence by non-state actors. He raised this in back in 2020. Uh, similarly, Chinese President Xi Jinping stated that uh, artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence is a vital uh, driving force for a new kind of technological and industrial revolution. And uh, uh, he urged the accelerated uh, development of artificial intelligence so that every people in this earth can grab opportunity. And uh, President Biden from the United States states that uh, he wants to shape the rules and govern the uh, this technology so that uh, that can be used to lift people up, not to uh, pin them down. So listening to all these world leaders, we can be sure about these particular technologies and uh, the power dynamics uh, that it plays uh, in the region. Uh, now, uh, uh, when you talk about artificial intelligence, the data is always the key because we have to feed data to uh, the system to make it function. So 
as you can see from this graph that uh, the data usage is set to reach 150,700 gigabytes per second by 2022. Uh, the use of uh, mobile devices, the internet penetration that has happened uh, during this decade is very crucial for the uh, advancement of artificial intelligence and uh, countries like India, China, who has a large population can utilize this data uh, to have uh, their prospect in uh, different fronts. Uh, there are uh, three core areas that I'll be describing today. Uh, first one is economic, second one is military, and third one is political front. And uh, I'll uh, briefly explain this, uh, uh, all these uh, three areas of impact. First, uh, economic front. So we can see from a quote over here, the more the economic power of nation, the more the power it can exert in a global arena. We can see uh, this uh, present is, is going through massive digital transformation and uh, we are having a great impact by the uh, advent of new technologies and AI is also playing a crucial role. And when you see the high income countries and developed countries, they are very, uh, they have pioneered the development of artificial intelligence and uh, the large economics uh, economies of the world like uh, China, United States and uh, India, they are the forefront of it. And especially China and United States are uh, at the top. Uh, the uh, governments are not the only one who are utilizing uh, the uh, technology, but private actors and commercial enterprises are also using it uh, to a maximum level. So the superiority of a country in the area of economy in this present age is tied to AI and the future is also holds um, the future of the country in terms of economic prospect is also hold in um, artificial intelligence. So as you can see the global share of the economy, uh, United States leads this followed by China. And uh, uh, since the present uh, uh, economy is based on service sector, manufacturing and others, uh, in the days to come, this will be outpaced by uh, formation of digital economy. So everybody are racing towards uh, to capture their share of this digital economy powered by artificial intelligence. Uh, in 2017, uh, Chinese government set an ambitious goal of becoming uh, the dominant leader in AI so that they can uh, have their piece of cake uh, of this digital revolution and they are uh, trying to capture $150 billion industry and become figured in this particular technology so that they can set the standards and ethical norms for AI and the independent uh, businesses and independent, uh, sorry, dependent use of uh, artificial intelligence in other uh, areas uh, amounts to trillions of dollars. So every countries are racing towards uh, achieving such kind of AI superiority. Why are doing so? Because artificial intelligence will uh, help them uh, make their economy robust, make them economically prosperous. When a country become economically prosperous, then they can have more leverage, they can have more say in international affairs. So they can provide aid to other countries, they can pour money as investment in other countries, and they can provide funding to multilateral organizations like the United Nations as well. So every countries are uh, vying to have AI superiority. <clears throat> Particularly in the Asia Pacific region, there are around 12 least developed countries. So least developed countries have no choice to, no choice other than to uh, make uh, countries who are economically prosperous in their, uh, to uh, make them happy. So uh, countries like United States, China and India are having a, a great deal of competition in luring such least developed countries to have them in their sphere of influence. And the massive economic benefits from AI can change the dynamics of power competition in the region so that one country can be favored over another. So this is the uh, economic front that I've described. Now I'll move towards uh, military front. Uh, Robert Kagan, a fellow, senior fellow at Brookings, uh, stated that military force is another element of power projection. It provides a nation the capability to impose its will on other nations through the threat or use of violence. Uh, so... Uh, from this point, we can easily say that military is one of the key areas where a country can project its power. So <clears throat> already artificial intelligence has been uh, the forefront of military applications. 
and uh, uh, the this is only said to rise in the days to come and most of the sophisticated technologies that are already built has already incorporated ai in the future weapons that are uh, going to be built will definitely uh, uh, incorporate ai why they will incorporate ai because artificial intelligence provide precision uh, to attack a particular target uh, they are more accurate and requires less human intervention so it is very beneficial for these countries to uh, integrate artificial intelligence in their weapons uh, although uh, humans are at the helm of uh, taking decisions in present regarding the use of nuclear weapons but this scenario is changing as ai systems are being utilized to assist human in this uh, non conventional weapons venture as well uh, we can see artificial sorry automated systems has failed in the past during the invasion of iraq where patriot missile batteries has shot down uh, its own aircraft um, friendly fire as we have seen friendly fire in the past as well so what if uh, the situation arises when a uh, automated system uh, which uh, uh, is implemented in nuclear based uh, weapon is utilized in firing such kind of uh, weapon so uh, the a simple or a minor mistake uh, when non conventional weapons like nuclear weapons can create a unavoidable unavoidable clashes between these nuclear powered nations so despite this uh, despite the uh, uh, bazards or despite the dangerous situation that can be arised with the use of ai technology and automated systems nations are putting big bets and faith in ai technologies and this has led to a kind of ai race and uh, uh, nations are vying to outpace others in this arena uh, in regard to uh, artificial intelligence there has been a growing distrust among the uh, different major powers particularly united states and china in the asia pacific uh, one considers that other is gaining ground in this arena so they are trying hard to um, be uh, technologically capable in comparison to other and uh, since the military industrial complex in the united states and state owned military uh, industrial complex in the in china uh, has a huge pool of scientists and researchers so they are working really hard to improve the system and why they are trying to improve their system because they want to project their power beyond their borders so we can see uh, from the growth and development of ai new alliances has been formed we can see quadrilateral quadrilateral security uh, nimesh nimesh uh, if you can wind up within a minute and a half please uh, ma'am i was informed uh, uh, of 15 minutes uh, i think it's 3 uh, minutes is still left if i'm not wrong ma'am okay according to me there was less but as soon as you can no problem yeah yeah, yeah ma'am i'll try to finish uh, as soon as possible so uh, quadrilateral countries has agreed to solidify their solidify their cooperation in regard to artificial intelligence to counter china and uh, and we can see uh, today there is a meeting of uh, quadrilateral alliance in uh, the united states where artificial intelligence is also the main uh, agenda for discussion there and next we can see a recent uh, nuclear uh, sorry recent uh, agreement between the three countries australia uk and united states called aukus which is uh, trying they are trying to enhance cooperation and in interoperability across ai and other technologies and this bit uh, these all these alliances are uh, trying to deter china in the asia pacific region and uh, with the implementation of ai and and now they can save expenses by increasing platform sharing and innovation cost as well lastly uh, uh, i'll talk about political front and as you all know our are stated the conflict between democracy and dictatorship is actually a conflict between two data processing system ai may swing the advantage towards the later so since we are in uh, information is um, countries have been blessed with artificial intelligence technology to surveil and monitor their uh, monitor their uh, citizens uh, in the united states uh, uh, um, they are monitoring and surveilling their citizens especially after the september 11 attacks and they do not want the same to happen in the future as well in china chinese communist party wants to hold a grip on power and 
curve any form of descents in their country. So they are utilizing such kind of technologies to, uh, 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 to solve their problems at home. And now after solving their problems at home, what they are doing now, they are selling these technologies to other countries as well. Chinese government especially shares its advanced surveillance technologies with nations all around the globe, including the authoritarian regimes like Myanmar in the Asia Pacific, uh, is reported by Carnegie, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So they are saying, uh, selling such kind of surveillance technologies and having a, a political say and having their leverage in, uh, uh, in other countries as well. So before concluding, I'll uh, also mention that Chinese government is also selling their technologies to democratic countries like Malaysia, where they are adopting Chinese tech form, uh, forms to equip their security personnel and security apparatus. And they are selling such kind of technologies so that they can have leverage. Uh, United States, since United States is hesitant to sell such kind of systems, the influence and power of China in the Asia Pacific is only set to grow. And uh, United States, States also trying to uh, share its technology to its, its alliance to increase its position in the Asia Pacific. Thank now I will conclude. Much. Yeah, uh, let okay, me conclude in uh, briefly. So in one or two sentences, I'll conclude that the power dynamics in this uh, Asia Pacific region has been in change in rapid and unprecedented ways. So uh, AI superior to key for United States to maintain its status and it is key for People's Republic of China to upgrade itself from great power to superpower status. And at the end, I, I would like to tell that historically, uh, technological advancement has always changed the power dynamics of the world. For instance, a nuclear weapon radically changed the power dynamics after and after the Second World War. Similarly, the advent and advancement of artificial intelligence can shape and condition alliances, determine the nature and extent of rivalry in the future, and can tilt the balance of power. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nimesh. You've covered a lot of ground. You can take your PowerPoint out of the uh, presentation zone. And uh, you've covered a whole lot of ground. And But there are other areas that we're looking at. And uh, hopefully, Sanya is going to take off on that and look at China, Pakistan as factors in the South Asian kind of perspective in uh, even looking at artificial intelligence and other non-traditional security concerns. Sanya, over to you. And you have... 15 minutes, please, because we don't want to do injustice to others. So we'll take it from there. Thank you. It's very Thank much visible, very clear. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can see the slides or not yet. Hello. I'm please click on share screen. Your screen is not shared. Sorry, Sanya, your slide is not visible anymore. You have to share screen. Yes, it's it's there now. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I wish I had more clarity about what I was supposed to answer in my presentation, but since I was working on the paper, a little bit of my title uh, has been changed. So I'll just quickly skim over to. Uh, I'm actually talking about the uh, broader context of strategic realignment and emerging threats uh, in, in Southern Asia and what are security implications. So the puzzle that I was trying to look at is that um, how this recent uh, Indo-Sino-Indo uh, uh, military standoff and US-China political face-off that we have seen since the Trump administration, it has kept us wondering as scholars that what uh, actually triggered that escalation and how this crisis uh, precipitated so fast. The existing arguments that are um, already there are, and very much in the debate is uh, one, that pandemic provided China an opportunity to escalate the border tensions with India. And uh, New York Times, uh, I would just simply go to one of the quotations, which says that the world is distracted by the coronavirus pandemic. China's military has encroached upon its neighbor's territories on several fronts throughout the spring and now into summer, flexing its military might in ways that have raised alarms across Asia and in Washington. The second group of scholars have actually contested that and said that China's strategic patience was running out on seeing growing um, uh, cooperation between India and the United States, and that actually threatened China's direct interests. Um, and for that, there are other, the scholars that are uh, really pitching the ground is saying that China does not like how India is getting closer to the United States and other key partners. 
So my argument, actually, after doing some research, um, I found that um, I believe that it is not China whose strategic patience is running low. In fact, it is the United States who feels frustrated with the sleep of the Asian dragon. Uh, Chinese philosophy and operational strategy that is deeply inspired from the teachings of Sun Tzu, um, was, uh, who was also a strong proponent of the effective nature of deception. And uh, in today's warfare with the media manipulation, information warfare, and cyber threats, uh, the combination of tactics to play with deception uh, with all kinetic and non-kinetic means can be numerous. Uh, and I think this is what uh, China is playing to its advantage. I also argue that at times uh, it is suggested that states stumble into armed conflicts, not because the threat is imminent, but because war planners presume if war is inevitable, better to have it sooner than later. And I think this is exactly the frustration that is going on in Washington, D.C. They are seeing the trajectory of China's uh, imminent rise, and they believe that even though right now China is not militarily capable to be contained, but if we let it go for a longer period of time, it's better to contain China sooner than later. If China is not demonstrating political willingness to use force, no sane player, I further argue, should bring its forces to Chinese border or territorial waters. World powers cannot provoke China when it chooses to remain unprovoked. And why I'm saying that is because the rationale of China's unprovoked stratagem lie in Suzu's philosophy of deception that also says that one, one's opponent are strong, evade them. And I think this is what exactly China is right now doing. It is confessing that how the emerging bloc, which is Indo-Pacific, is emerging in its power capabilities. It's better not to confront them until China is confident to take uh, the bull by its horns. So why this discussion is important, it is important because US and its strategic partners, too wary of China's anticipated rise, and they may pose war spanning one third of the globe, which is entire of the Southeast Asia, South China Sea and East China Sea. And when several nuclear powers are involved, clearly we can see more than three nuclear powers and their noble forces in the military exercises in South or East China Sea, the chances of miscalculation could be grave uh, in such uh, a scenario. So where is this uh, paranoia coming from regarding how China would react uh, and how China is going to act in the South China Sea? I think the, the China threat theory is not new. Uh, it, has, it dates back to early 1990s. And there's a lot of academic pessimism in talking about China's threat. The literature on China threat theory is still deficient to fully convince scholars if China's rise is as threatening as promulgated by some sinologists. It is still not clear if China is an aggressor or a strategic partner among the world powers. And to support that argument, I have some clear um, statements. One is from Condoleezza Rice, the former Secretary of State. In 2020 election campaign, she said, uh, she disagreed with Clinton's policy of engagement. And she said, even if there is an argument of economic integration with Beijing, China is still a potential threat to stability in the Asia Pacific region. But she further said that China's military power is currently no match to that of the United States. Then we have General Mark Malay testified before the Congress just this year. And he said, China wants to invade and hold Taiwan within the next six years, but might not intend to do so in the near term. There's no reason for it. And the cost to China far exceeds the benefit and President Xi and his military would do the calculation and would know that an invasion of such an island, which is as big and with so many people, would be extraordinarily complicated and costly. And his perceptions, the next 12 to 24 months, he does not see early warning indicators. And then we have a US Naval War College uh, former director who says that by 2035, China should be much stronger economically and technologically may have become a global leader in innovation and have completed its military modernization. By China's Republic uh, of 2049, China should have resolved the Taiwan question and be a strong country with world-class forces. And none of these suppositions, which are coming from the people who have some kind of intel information, suggest that China is an imminent threat in the region, uh, as it is promulgated by most of the um, uh, war hawks. So the strength of the China threat argument 
which I said earlier, actually dates back to the early 1990s. Uh, and the proponents are actually saying the same thing, the China's economic growth and military modernization, uh, and they totally reject the concept of peaceful rise, and also further suggest that the possibilities um, uh, should be there to contain China right now, and the urgency to contain China right now. One of the strong assumptions underlying this China threat theory actually originates from non-Western and pro-communist trends of the Chinese culture and ideology, something that has already been highlighted by Samuel Huntington in Clash of Civilizations. We also know um, scholars like Graham Allison in Destin for War has actually wrote, written about, it was the rise of Athens and the fear that is instilled in Sparta that make war inevitable. Something that is all, already in academia is known as a security dilemma that when social structure is composed of intersubjective misunderstandings, uh, the states have the tendency to take uh, worst case scenarios very seriously, and that is where they go for preemptive or preventive war options. So we have criticism to China threat three, and and this is uh, uh, to be fair to fall into two economic camps. The one are deterrence optimists that we all know, think about, and we have deterrence optimists that actually talk about if there is, um, th there was no hot war between the coal rivals during uh, Cold War, then we should also expect that there would be no hot war between China and uh, United States. And, and the same classic argument goes that the military standoffs and the crisis is actually a condition of a stable nuclear deterrence. The second argument falls in more pessimist camp, and they talk about that all our nuclear war probably would not be an option. However, there would be regional conflicts, would be localized uh, near Taiwan or in the South or East China Sea. Uh, and for those, for those who believe in that argument, also believe that China is not like the Soviet Union or Russia and would not react like Soviet Union because of the capitalist marketplace, shared interest in holding climate change, uh, fighting terrorism and combating pandemics, something that China is um, uh, playing a role in the world stage and could be taken as a crucial partner, uh, if not a, a worst uh, rival. And then, then there's a, a lot of significance in understanding how much this threat is real and in, uh, or exaggerated in terms of empiricism. China's per capita GDP is 18 grand um, in US dollars as compared to United States 59 grand. And uh, China's militarization of islands is not as worrisome as propagated uh, according to China, uh, American own scholars who believe that th those islands are like maroon aircraft carriers sitting ducks to be wiped out by pre-targeted American vessels. So while we have those um, assertions, uh, which are academically and proved by empiricism, uh, we see that alarmists still worry about it. Um, uh, Australian former prime minister writes in foreign affairs about how serious the threat is, of, a threat of war is between United States and China. And he suggests that the political leadership, economic and strategic compulsions uh, are for stating China and Chinese leadership for decades. And he believes that this could be the reason that would compel President Xi to go in similar uh, uh, circumstances as Mao uh, when he was invading uh, Korean conflict. Uh, India's former um, army chief, Vipin Rawat, also uh, warned about uh, China's salami slicing tactics to engulf contested territories. And he explained what salami uh, slicing is, that is a very uh, subtle divide and conquer tactic used to dominate opposition territory piece by piece. So if that is the case, if Mao uh, or Xi is actually acting like Mao and if he shares the same political vision as it is there, then why uh, uh, in this standoff, uh, United, uh, in this standoff China actually uh, did not uh, went further uh, to engulf some of the territory from India. And, and that is the question that I kept thinking about uh, while understanding. From my uh, academic standpoint, uh, China's concerns with Taiwan and the US military presence in the Western Pacific, conflict with North Korea and some littoral states of the South China Sea, uh, all these uh, conflict is actually brewing up in the past, but uh, Xi is actually not like Mao, and he's taking more slow and, and different strategic approach in approaching China strategies. And the first thing that comes over here uh, in China strategies is basically one belt, one road initiative, um, uh, economic corridor with Pakistan, how Pakistan could, is actually a strategic asset for uh, China in helping uh, in growth and, and economic rise of, uh, in, in further enhancing the rise of China. Uh, 
Pakistan is actually going to have a $46 billion investment. And from scholars' point of view who want to see whichever perspective they want to see, I think CPAC has all dimensions. It's like an overarching strategic cooperation between Pakistan and China. Uh, it has uh, economic energy aspect. It has political aspect because Pakistan is actually uh, was looking for a strong partner, major power uh, on its side, even though the cooperation between China has been in the backstage for decades. But Pakistan wanted to replace psychologically a superpower with another major power as US was turning its eyes away. And China was the one who actually filled in to, uh, to fill that political vacuum. We also see on the strategic end, the gateway access that uh, uh, Pakistan geography actually provides to Afghanistan when uh, the situation, current situation is right in front of our eyes. America has left uh, and how uh, Taliban regime has been strongly embraced by Chinese leadership. So uh, Pakistan would be a key player uh, for China's interest. China, in the if we can just, we, we can just conclude in about a minute, please. Absolutely. And I'll leave it for the question answer session. Uh, I'm sorry, this came out of my paper, so it is too vast than it could handle. I will just quickly come to the last slide. Um, what this strategic alignment uh, means and strategic cooperation uh, leads to dilemmas. I think there are two major dilemmas for India and Pakistan independently. But one thing that came out good out of this standoff, uh, both in, in 2019 between Pakistan and India and 2020 Sino-India, was that there is an acceptance of strategic realignment between Pakistan and China and US and Russia. India has been a reluctant partner to fully come out as, as partner of uh, United States, but this time it was very clear that after the conflict um, uh, in, in, with, with China and India came out very much um, open about its uh, partnership. Uh, second thing is China is now um, a contested party in the Gulf of Baltistan with Pakistan on the World Road, in the Belt and Road Initiative. China's physical presence is now going to impact the future uh, conflict and uh, with India and Pakistan and the Kashmir crisis. Um, I think uh, what is more worrisome for Pakistan and India to think independently is how they are going to view their uh, previous alliances, how India will balance relationships, uh, relationship with Russia when 60 to 70 percent of India's weapons are of Soviet and Russian region and Moscow uh, views uh, Indo-Pacific uh, hostile to the region and how Pakistan is going to literally replace China uh, with US, uh, even though there's a lot of arms procurement uh, with and strategic cooperation with China between between Pakistan and China, but still uh, there was a comforting factor where US uh, was there for Pakistan to provide a diplomatic and political coverage. So that, um, that being said, I would just conclude it here that how Pakistan is going to adjust uh, those dilemmas and rest of the questions I can uh, address them in the question answer session. Thank you. Bless you. Thanks, Sanya. You stuck to the time and I think you covered so much of ground. I could see you were glossing over a lot of the slides. Without much ado, I think you need to stop sharing your uh, presentation. I think we can see your screen. <laughs> it's okay. I'm trying to... Uh, with the technology. So we is. have... Uh, I, I want... Uh, Jyotishman is next. Jyotishman, if you can do it under 15, I miscalculated because we need Q&A time as well. Um, so please go ahead and uh, try to, you know, uh, kind of put in the points and not elaborating too much. Let's leave that for Q&A. Let's have a dynamic Q&A as well. Hopefully we will have time. We are going to eat into some of the time of the tea break. But uh, I guess online that's allowed. Okay, Jyotishme, uh, all yours. I'm, and I'm, you are I'm looking trying... at the swing states, is it? In the changing uh, yeah. Asia Pacific security correct, architecture, India and Indonesia. Great. Uh, I'm just trying to, um, there is some security and privacy issue here with my laptop. I, uh, uh, will the technical help uh, just uh, kind of help? Uh, security and privacy diplomatics. So I'm just trying to open it from my side. Uh, oh, the option is not coming. Um, uh, foresight on my part, I have not acknowledged the co chair, Dr. Iram Rao. Uh, is it Iram Rao or is it Dr. Swati Rao? Is that the same name or is that a combination here? I don't think so. I'm Swasti. I don't know about Iram. Well, it says that the co-chair is the vice principal associate pro professor Bhaskar Acharya College of Applied Sciences, uh, Delhi University. But uh, ma'am, I, 
Ma'am, I think I'll have to quit and reopen Zoom. Uh, could you just give me one minute? Uh, there okay. is some security and privacy issue with my laptop. So okay. I'll just Divya, have to quit. Could you and... tell the technical support please to help uh, Jyotishman? Jyotishman, should we move on to the next person and then we'll come back to you? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, Jyotishman, please install Zoom app. Uh, Zoom app is already uh, Co-chair couldn't join uh, because of okay. some uh, personal reasons. So okay. that's it. and we got to so know. That's fine. I, I just thought it would be remiss for me to not acknowledge. Yeah. Uh, we'll you, wait for Jyotish Pan to join later. So I want the collaborative paper now. I don't know who's going to present. Swati Rao, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kuvar Alkendra, Pratap Singh, and Malcolm Davis, who are going to look at ro rogue versus responsible approach to space 2.0. Mapping India, Cod Collaboration Matrix in the Outer Space in the 21st Century. That's so, um, all yours. Okay, thank you. So, I'm Smasti and I'll be presenting this paper. With this, uh, please allow me to share my screen. Um, please tell me. I don't know if it's me, but your volume is a little low. If you can kind of increase that. Okay, I'll just do that and I'll also speak louder. All right, I think it will be Yes, better. yes, please, please thank speak you. louder and please upload yeah. if you have or if you're speaking, that's fine. Yeah, I, is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, it is. All and, right. Uh, so, yeah, I, so, yeah. yeah, I start now. So uh, this is a collaborative paper, but uh, you know that I'm doing with Dr. Uh, Alkendra Pratap Singh and Dr. Malcolm Davis, and uh, you know we are looking at uh, basically the space behavior uh, of space pairing nations, and we are arguing that Dr. Space Swa uh, Dr. Swasti, you have to be a little louder. All right. Okay. So I said that we are looking at the space behavior of space pairing nations, and we are arguing that. Uh, the space behavior that is emerging is such that uh, we see a kind of a cord collaboration uh, coming up in outer space. Uh, and this is what the paper is on about. Um, uh, space governance, you know, as has been a major concern for the international community in recent decades for a variety of factors, because number of space bearing nations has been rising and that has been leading to militarization and commercialization of space. Then there is the role of private entities that are entering. Along with this, we see the Chinese behavior of global dominance, uh, you know, show in their space behavior as well. Because, you know, we all know that what is their idea under Xi Jinping? They want, they do not only plan to defeat the West, but they want to establish Chinese hegemony over land, water and space. Uh, in 2021, uh, there is a U.S. intelligence community report, which is known as ATA, also known as the Annual Threat Assessment, where um, apart from North Korea and Russia, one uh, major threat that was outlined was China's push to counter U.S. supremacy in space. Not just that, space also becomes very complicated because there is a mustering of space industries. So it is also not just the militarization, but also the commercialization because about 300 billion uh, you know, dollars uh, revenue generation is also directly related. So uh, you all, we have the US global positioning system, the Russian uh, GLONASS system, and now the Chinese Baidu satellite navigation system. So all I'm trying to say in this particular slide is that when we look at space, space is already a really cluttered space. Now, space is going to be the arena for major power struggle among different space pairing nations. Um, generally, and India cannot afford to lose out, right? Because there is a changing security complex and there are related challenges that are coming up, which are very obvious. There is a threat of terrorism, there's a renewed need for intelligence sharing, there's artificial intelligence coming up, et cetera. And we had wonderful papers in this panel about it. So uh, one thing that we need to understand is that China's ambitions in space have proved to be as aggressive and roguish as they are in land. And I will tell you how. China's careful balancing, India's care careful balancing at land and sea should be applied to India's space pairing behavior too. That is one of the arguments that I'm making. And I'm saying that accord-like cooperation is the most Pareto optimal option for India. And I will tell you how, what it really can India do. And what, apart from this, we can also see India's commitment to strategic autonomy that is evident in India's space behavior. And I would love to take your on that. Um, when I say that China's uh, space intervention has been roguish and aggressive, why do I say it? 
Uh, there is a little history to that, which is that China was banned from joining the International Space Station in 2011. And I will give you the reasons shortly. Uh, this banning led to China to aspire for making their own space stations. And in 2011, they launched a space station called Tiangong-1, which was followed by in, uh, Tiangong-2 in 2016. And the final size of the Chinese space station is expected to be much smaller than the current ISS and is expected to be completed by 2023. In fact, they, uh, they are planning to do it before that. Now, what makes it interesting, okay, and where, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, where, the, where the competition and conflict uh, comes in is that the European Space Agency has been open to collaborate with China in the ISS, and Italy actually has agreed to collaborate with China. Now, as you can see that this kind of starts a fertile ground for a completely new set of problems and existential threats in outer space. So the question is, what are other space faring nations doing about it? What is India doing about it, right? So in 2020 alone, the Chinese have carried out a record 39 launches in the space, sending 89 spacecraft, second only to US that sent about 44. Now, like I say, it's not just the European Space Agency and Italy. If you look at the angle of Russia, the problem becomes a little more complicated because Russia, uh, they plan to make their own space station and uh, they have declared that they would be withdrawing from the International Space Station by 2025. They would build and manage their own floating laboratory uh, and they are planning to launch it by 2030. Now, this decision uh, to leave the uh, ISS also comes at a time when relations between Russia and US have been steadily deteriorating on multiple fronts, with the two powers also accusing each other of militarizing space. Now, uh, you know, there was a time when Russia was indispensable to US because of their Soyuz passenger vehicle, which served as the only way of transporting astronauts to I uh, ISS ever since the US retired its space shuttle program in 2011. And I'm referring to Colombia here. So this reliance on Russia ended last year when US started to use the SpaceX system developed by Elon Musk. And because of this reliance that ended on Russia, Russia lost out, lost out on the money they used to make from Soyuz passenger vehicles from US. So uh, there was this monetary loss uh, that was involved. Not just that, Russia has already rejected the US offer to become a part of their lunar program, which is the Artemis program. And in August 2021, a couple of months ago, they have signed an agreement with China to jointly develop a lunar base. Now, uh, when I say that the Chinese space behavior is roguish, uh, basically I, uh, I deduce it from, uh, uh, from the testing of the anti-satellite weapon in 2007. Uh, why was this roguish? Is because it completely flouted international norms with respect to space debris. Uh, there was a consistent aggressive pattern that can be traced from there till date in China's space cooperation with countries like Pakistan and North Korea. So uh, the paper here highlights a serious caveat that the military race triggered by China's aggressive space maneuvers will inevitably lead to a classic security dilemma that will be disastrous because of the consequences of space debris, because China doesn't really seem to care about the question and that has already outnumbered the operational objects. So this continues to pose threats of disastrous collisions with space stations. And eventually, you know, if things go really bad, threatens the very existence of human life on Earth. So like I said, a court-like cooperation might emerge. What is the likelihood of it? Uh, we will look at that, okay? See, so the first reason why a court-like cooperation is likely to emerge is because of the very nature of ISS. The International Space System is a collaborative space station headed by NASA, which is, a, which is the U.S. space agency. And it is now in the last leg of it, its existence and is expected to become redundant, most likely from 2028. Now, China, like I said, is not an ISS partner. They were banned from joining ISS and no Chinese nationals have been aborted. China have their own contemporary human space program. It's called Project 921, etc. So the point is that why was China banned? So there were two matters of distrust. One is the anti-satellite weapon 2007 testing, which I said flouted international norms about space debris, which is a very important existential uh, threat to human life. And second was hacking of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory intellectual property. 
So this, these two basically fueled a bill in the United States, which was passed in 2011, and that banned China from joining the International Space Station. Now, uh, so the fact that the International Space Station is coming to an end now calls for some sort of a collaboration which is likely to emerge, right? Now, the second factor is that uh, China's engagement in space, uh, you know, is very feverish, okay? And what is there to worry about? Like I said, that because of this, uh, the, uh, the, the democratic countries, the democracies of the world are likely to come together. One is the Chinese space stations in the LEO, uh, which is the lower earth module. Uh, so they have already sent three modules that, that they are sent separately, but they are eventually going, going to be joined, okay? And if you really look at experts, and I'm actually collaborating with them, uh, this is not really a benign thing, and this move could imply a civil military integration at all levels, okay? So this is something which is extremely hybrid. The second uh, thing to worry about is Chinese lunar ambitions, okay? Because like you know, uh, you know, all the countries, the space-faring nations, moon is very important. And why is the moon so important? Because see, the moon has helium-3, which is a non-radioactive isotope, Moon has about 5 million tons of helium-3. Earth doesn't have as much. And China is looking aggressively to reduce its coal dependency. And can you, you can just imagine the economic impact of a carbon-free world. And that would be an opportunity for the future of mankind. And China wants to sort of come in and lead this, right? So helium-3 can, be, can become the most sought-after asset. So on uh, March 19, 2021, along with the Russian agency, the Chinese Space Agency announced that both of them together will be making the international lunar mission jointly. And one of the objectives is very clear, to get helium-3 back on Earth. And the third is Chinese presence on Mars. Now, in July 23rd, 2020, the Chinese rocket, and it's a famous one, the Long March, it successfully left the ground, leaving the Earth orbit. And seven months later, the probe entered the orbit and then the rover touched the surface. So basically, China happens to be the first country where, uh, you know, leaving the, leaving the Earth orbit, entering the Martian orbit, and actually uh, touching the surface of Mars, Mars, all these three happened at the same time. So this is also something that uh, really kind of shows as to how feverish China I think I'd is. like to request you to kind of wind up. So if okay. you can conclude. Okay, all right. It's just 10 minutes, but I think, um, I think, uh, okay, fine. So what I do is that, um, give me two minutes, because I just want to make some sense out of this. So and then as like I said, the China Pakistan, I is there China is uh, kind of uh, supporting Pakistan, you know, to launch their satellites, etc. And now I will just come and say that, uh, what really can India do, right? So that was the idea. So the paper says that India can actually do four, there are four pathways that uh, that exist. First is that India should maintain a norm-abiding independent approach because India has a you know, reputation of a responsible space for nation and that is going to go a long way in other countries coming in collaborating with India. Second, India must maintain a steady pace of development and 2021 is going to be very, very crucial because in the last one year, the activities have really risen. Third, India must collaborate proactively with other Quad members, like I said, and fourth, all of these three will enable India to have a hybrid engagement with outer space that we call in a paper Space 2.0. Very quickly, what is India, ISRO and NASA doing? ISRO and NASA doing a few things. They're making the world's most expensive satellite, NASAR. In, what is ISRO and JAXA doing, which is a Japanese agency? Uh, they are doing a lot of work, you know, and I've, I've listed a lot of details. Uh, I would like, love to take questions on it. But one of the most important things that they're doing is that they, are, they, are, they have collaborated on making their own uh, lunar program, which is going to supplement the American uh, lunar program. Uh, similarly, what is uh, you know, ISRO and ASA doing, which is India and Australia? Similarly, they have signed an amendment you know, this year, earlier this year, on uh, you know, cooperation in civil space, uh, science, technology, and education. So I think with this, I come to the end of today, uh, you know, my presentation, and I would be, uh, I would love to take questions because a lot of details I could not uh, discuss uh, because of paucity of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Swati. I have to apologize for doing injustice to all of you in giving, you know, and especially your paper, but you compressed it amazingly. You had all the points there, so we've got an idea. And hopefully, you know, we'll take that forth in the Q&A.
if uh, uh, jyotish man is ready it's fine are you are you okay yeah. to do it jyotish man yes yeah, sir sure. and just uh, for the record we'll have aditi uh, priya next after jyotish man and uh, i'm going to take the liberty of the host university uh, uh, you know faculty of the presenter to be the last in the series uh, dr nagalakshmi <laughs> problem ma'am no problem so, so aditi priya after uh, uh, jagnesh yeah, present jo jyotish man presents jyotish man go for it yeah okay um uh, thank you I everyone have to cut down your time a bit so if we can do it around 12 because then the extension becomes from 15 to 16 so we'll 12 so within 12 13 if you can finish yeah i'll try my best ma'am it's just very very short presentation so it shouldn't take much time but great, great. yeah sure uh yeah so the topic of my presentation is uh, um, obviously this is on swing states uh so i'm going to present on the critical role of swing states in this uh, changing asia pacific security architecture i'm primarily looking at two states india and indonesia now before i come to uh, the role of uh, swing states in the region it's important to first uh uh first you know first have a look at the secu- at, the, at the contemporary security architecture of the of the region i'm using the term indo pacific because it is uh yeah, you know it's it's a term uh, in currency currently and uh, it also sort of uh you know um uh, highlights the, the the dominant role that india has uh in the region uh so i'm just using it in the presentation for uh, for this uh so yeah the current uh, security architecture i mean the, you know the asia pacific region or the indo pacific region has uh, undergone fundamental changes in the last two decades uh, primarily because of uh, the rise of china as a revisionist power um, the rise of china has led to significant developments in the entire region um, you know from um, you know building it, uh, artificial islands or land reclamation projects um you know to uh, having um, a very aggressive uh, you know uh, 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 you know military build up in the region uh, you know the chinese uh, the, uh, you know uh, they are currently the uh, um, the fastest growing navy in the world uh, in fact it is faster it is growing faster than the next eight navies combined so we can very well understand the um, you know the aggressive build up of the aggressive naval build up that china is currently doing uh, in this in, in this region um china has also underwent a lot of uh, you know military activities uh, from uh, uh, you know obviously the maritime militia is one uh, then they have the largest coast guard which has been involved in some disputes uh, with uh, japan in the senkaku islands vietnam um, indonesia so uh, there has been a lot of activities a lot of heightened activities uh, in in especially in the last two decades in the region there have also been uh, you know some uh, political economic uh, uh moves uh, by china uh, uh uh which requires a greater understanding you know for for instance they have been successful in preventing um you know preventing asean from taking a unified position in the entire region i mean every nation every country talks about uh, asean centrality um, but uh, but asean has been reduced to more of uh, you know there has been a lot of uh, uh, uh you know uh, 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 basically the you know there has not been a unified position that the asean has been able to take uh, china has been able to uh, have extensive ties with especially two countries laos and cambodia which has been preventing asean from taking a unified stand and as a result we have we have seen that i mean uh, there has still till now there has been no code of conduct in the region um, obviously uh, because of and also uh, because of these activities you know the us and or the free world to say uh, they have also uh, you know uh, they have also increased their engagement the us obviously is the most uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the us has started the asia pivot policy under president obama uh, which is basically a rebalancing of forces uh, from other region to to this particular region to uh, have you know to better check on china or to contain china uh, then um, you know under under the trump administration the us started the trade war which is uh, in a way still continuing um, Uh, the Biden administration has also, uh, you know, they, they have also, it, despite change in administration, they have also not uh, removed uh, the certain barriers that the Trump administration enforced, uh, especially on goods coming from China. Uh, you know, Defense Secretary Mark Esper, the then Defense Secretary in 2020, he he noted that the Indo-Pacific is the epicenter of great power competition with China. So we are actually, you know, there is acknowledgement of, uh, you know, from from that side itself that you know there is a Uh, you know, great power rivalry that is going on uh, in the region, and 
Uh, what I want, uh, and obviously the Indo, Indo Pacific region is like the, yeah, it, it is the center, the fulcrum of global geopolitics currently. Uh, so that is why this region is of particular importance. Uh, we are also, uh, we have also seen the emergence of um, certain blocks or groups, uh, uh, especially with the, you know, obviously with the uh, intention to uh, contain China. Why it is obviously, uh, you know, it is, it has come into, uh, it has been, uh, you know, it, in fact, uh, uh, the AUKUS has also recently come up. And uh, what is also important to note here is that even during the COVID pandemic, uh, when there was a lot of, you know, what was still meeting, I mean, there was virtual meetings as well as personal meetings, face-to-face uh, -face meetings that was still going on. So this actually highlights the importance that uh, that all the countries, I mean, the free world places on, free world as in this four what countries places on uh, on this block. Uh, so the current security architecture of the Indo-Pacific region, uh, you know, it's a it's a rapidly changing one, but uh, but it is it also highlights the you know the way that uh, uh, you know uh, the geopolitics is being changed. You know, it's altering in the region, and uh, and because of the uh, and because of this very uh, changing nature of uh, you know uh, great uh, you know, of the security architecture in the region, the role of swing states like India and Indonesia uh, come into you know traction. Uh, so these are uh, these are the four, as you can see from my slide. These are the four uh, in advantages that these uh, swing states have uh, when it comes to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, advantages that the swing states have, uh, be it uh, to uh, to you know uh, when it comes to either containing China or to helping China. Obviously, uh, there has been a lot of effort towards uh, the former. But uh, but they are, uh, but uh, primarily what makes the India and Indonesia very critical um, in this region is, is because of these four factors. One is geographic advantage, economic strength, uh, diplomatic po or political power, and of course population and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the huge landmass that they have. Uh, geography alone is actually a critical determinant. I mean the, the the reason why I included Indonesia is primarily because of geography. Uh, uh, because if you look at the region, I mean, if you look at those choke points and uh, you know the sea lines of communication that I've uh, shown in the uh, you know in the presentation, you can very well understand uh, why this why these two countries are very important. So you know, for any country to that uh, you know uh, more than ninety percent of uh, China's oil trade actually passes through this region, and uh, and uh, be Japan, be Taiwan, be the Southeast Asian countries. They are uh, these particular sea lines of communication, these particular choke points, you know, for Gulf of Aden, um, you know, Strait of Hormuz, uh, Strait of Malacca. These are extremely, these are of extreme importance. And uh, you know, many analysts even note that if China has a vulnerability, it is in in in, in these choke points. In fact, uh, Hu Jintao also uh, coined the term Malacca, the Malacca Strait dilemma to highlight this important you know, uh, you know thing. And uh, and because of uh, and because of the the uh, you know the geographical location of India uh, and Indonesia. Uh, these two states can basically directly overlook uh, these choke points. India is of extremely uh, critical nature. Um, yeah, this is uh, of this is also uh, uh, you know acknowledged by uh, by other countries like you know Australia. The former president of Australia, uh, Tony Abbott, he stated that you know the answer to almost every question about China is India. Uh, similarly, you know uh, uh, Alex Wong, the then U.S. Deputy Secretary. Uh, of BW Station FS, he stated that it is in our interest, uh, and I quote, it is in our interest, the US interest, as well as the interest of the region that India plays an increasingly weighty role in the region. India is a nation that is invested in a free and open order. So a lot of countries are actually counting on India because of because India has certain advantages which have come uh, uh, further. But primarily because of geography is a critical determinant. I mean, it is the most important factor that uh, that actually makes these states very critical uh, you know, uh, in in their in these efforts, um, obviously, uh, economic strength is another important. Um, you know, thing. India is obviously the fifth largest economy in the world. Yutish uh, Man, could you even speak a little louder, especially when you're concluding now? Little louder, yes, please. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, economic strength. And, is and, and within within a minute or two would be great if you could wind up. Oh. Okay. So obviously, you know, these are members of G20. They are, uh, India is the fifth largest economy. Indonesia is also projected to become the fifth largest economy by 2050. Um, uh, they have a huge diplomatic and political power because of the population size, because of their increasingly increasing role in world affairs. And obviously population gives them a distinct advantage. Now, as I said, India is an extremely important uh, uh, player in the region because it's a major military power, it's a nuclear state. 
It shares a land border with China. It is also a member of Quad, an important economic group, like G20. It also has the strongest navy in the Indian Ocean region, uh, arguably. Uh, and it is, in fact, already competing with China in many spheres. You know, when that uh, Galwan clash happened, it, uh, 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 the Indian government responded by targeting the Chinese digital companies. You know, because that is where China is trying to attain supremacy today. So India is a critical player in uh, in this region, and Indonesia, as I said, you know, geography alone gives them a distinct advantage. But other than that, obviously, you know, being a member of uh, important groupings like ASEAN, uh, a direct player in the region, uh, being a member of G20, OIC, it gives them huge diplomatic, uh, you know, advantage. It uh, and obviously, it is the largest economy in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, so what I am uh, arguing is that, as you can see, I mean, there are two two particular two clashes actually gave. Uh, actually make these states are obviously initially they were very reluctant to directly uh, engage in a covert ha overt hedging strategy against China. But the Galwan clash in India and the Natuna Island uh, clashes that happened uh, near the uh, waters of the Natuna Islands, it actually provoked these two countries to engage in a more overt hedging strategy. And, uh, and there are also two more factors in it because one is obviously there are strong leadership in both these countries. And there is also a rising wave of nationalism that is present in both these countries. Then, uh, and as a result, they are actively engaging with external powers. You know, Japan, uh, uh, Suga, Prime Minister Suga, the first visit he took was Vietnam and Indonesia after uh, after swearing it. Um, and that, uh, that happened two days after the Quad summit. And uh, his predecessor Shinzo Abe also, also uh, made the first, uh, made his first uh, prime minister visits to India, uh, to Indonesia and Vietnam. That actually uh, underlines how much importance even the Quad states are giving to, um, to Indonesia. Um, Obviously, uh, the, the two countries are also teaming up. Uh, they are also jointly uh, engaged in a lot of activities. India has uh, shown uh, you know, ex um, uh, greater flexibility to even train uh, Indonesian uh, sailors in, the, in, uh, in submarine warfare. They are, uh, they are involved in a lot of military exercises as well. They are involved. Uh, they, um, I mean, uh, India actually has also shown interest I mean, uh, to develop the Sabang port, which is situated at the mouth of the Malacca. Uh, Malacca Strait. So they are also a lot of. Uh, they are also, uh, uh, you know, involved in a lot of, a uh, uh, lot of activities uh, bilaterally as well. And uh, as I said, you know, they are, you know, China, uh, Indonesia has uh, outrightly rejected the, uh, the China's nine dash line claim. Uh, India has also been engaging already in a very uh, overt manner. Uh, they are adopting a muscular, you know, stance in the in the Indian Ocean region. So they are, you know, in a way hitting where it hurts more, hurts the most uh, to the Chinese. And uh, and you know, looking at the uh, you know, state behavior, you know, if you uh, analyzing the current state behavior in the region, it can be argued that both these countries, I mean, the free world actually, is engaged. Uh, uh, you know, they are actually headed towards a suicide trap. Uh, with regard to China. Um, uh, so, Jyotishman, we'll leave so, the rest yeah. for Q&A. So and that, your... is, that is all I have. Uh, thank you, yeah. thank if you. Any I questions, think I'll you're... be happy to take any question. For... Yeah, yeah. Sure. And your slides thank were you. slides were pretty self-explanatory, so that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank request you. Dr. Aditi uh, Priya, if, if she's there. Okay. Uh, in which case, we'll go on to the next speaker. Aditi Priya is there? No. We'll go on to the next who's in line, uh, Mr. Akash Sahu, who's going to speak on the internal dynamics of the Quad and the Asian security. So Akash, all yours. Uh, if you can do within 12 minutes would be great because that will give us Q&A. Sure, 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 ma'am. Thank you and so much. And your volume is great. Uh, we couldn't hear the previous speaker very well. Yes. Please okay, go okay. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor. I will. Uh, uh, I have a very short and concise presentation, so I'll very quickly go through that. I would want to share my screen. Please give me a minute. Uh, I'd like to request the organizers, uh, Dr. Nag Professor Nagalakshmi, if the technical support can help the speakers who are left, so Sarabjit Kaur, who's from Amity itself, Aditi Priya, so that they are already online before their time comes and we don't, you know, take the time during the session. Yes, Akash, yes. Just, just share screen and, you know, on full screen. Are you not able to do that? Yeah, great. Yeah, no, 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 no. I am uh, uh, now. Okay. Yes, it's visible. You can make it full. Okay, yes. So, my 
uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. My presentation is on Asian security and the internal dynamics of Quad. I'm going to talk about how the region has, uh, uh, how the security atmosphere in the region has evolved to give rise to security arrangements, which have not been uh, seen as, uh, as uh, absolutely essential earlier, but now have become uh, uh, very vital. And uh, all these countries, which are, uh, which are middle powers in the Indo-Pacific region, find it extremely uh, necessary to have a kind of cooperation within themselves uh, and uh, to, to basically uh, uh, maintain a balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, this is the uh, map of the Indo-Pacific. Now, Indo-Pacific has been interpreted by different powers in different ways. But uh, what India says is that it's, uh, it is from uh, west coast, uh, uh, from e east coast of Africa to the western uh, part of the United States. And this is the entire region that uh, uh, essentially comes under the Indo-Pacific. And uh, uh, Indo-Pacific has become the norm of the day, the, the term that has been very frequently used because it contains all the very fast developing economies. It, has, uh, it, it contains all the countries which are spending a lot on defense. And uh, uh, they also have unique challenges as, uh, as, the, uh, as opportunities that come in the Indo-Pacific. There are also uh, reservations on how the region is going to handle these uh, challenges. For example, uh, climate change is going to be a very significant challenge in the Indo-Pacific. And the countries have started to uh, cooperate on how they are going to be tackling these uh, long-term challenges in, in the coming time. The rise of China, of course, is, is a very uh, root factor for, uh, for, the, for the security environment in the Indo-Pacific. China has, uh, has uh, risen uh, exponentially in its military power, in its economic power, and uh, has certain ambitions of restoring the, the, the kind of uh, glory and empire that it, it, it had before the colonial times. So uh, uh, tackling, managing relations with China is essentially uh, a, a foreign policy issue for most powers in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Indo-Pacific is also theater to uh, great power competition because America has been present in the region much earlier than, uh, than we would imagine as, uh, as the, uh, the, the discussion has moved now to the Indo-Pacific, but America has uh, its presence since, uh, since uh, some time. It, it has uh, 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 the conflicts in South China Sea, East China Sea, the Korean Peninsula, the possibility of nuclear conflict, and the India-China Himalayan borders, which is already uh, written in conflict. So these are all areas which have the potential of growing into larger conflicts, but uh, so far they have, they have been contained. Uh, 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 due to the diplomacy of these uh, uh, powers. The need for security arra arrangements arises out of uh, a very uh, aggressive style uh, of diplomacy that we have seen in case of China. And uh, uh, it has uh, claimed uh, areas in, in vast maritime region in the South China Sea. It has uh, claimed uh, uh, land territories uh, on its borders with India and uh, uh, a very key point is that uh, this kind of coexistence of China with, with its neighboring countries and in the Indo-Pacific has not been there earlier. So when there was, uh, when uh, it was not a liberal order and it was a monarchical order, that was the time when China was uh, a very large economy and it was a predominant power in the region. But after the US, has, uh, has uh, uh, after the US has uh, come into the picture, that has not been the case. So this is the kind of change that we are, uh, that, uh, that the region is resisting. And uh, a lot of these countries which are caught in the middle want to see a multipolar arrangement on, and not uh, the dominance of one kind of uh, uh, power, whether it's uh, the US or whether it's China. Quad has come from a long way uh, as a disaster relief organization in 2004 to a security framework in 2017. Uh, in the middle, it had lost its charm, it had lost its relevance. And uh, that was because the countries could not fathom that uh, there would be problems of the kind that we're seeing today, uh, let's say 10 years ago. And uh, that is how Quad has come together in itself. Uh, this is a, a picture which would show you how frequently 
China has uh, has had, has uh, uh, shown very aggressive postures in the South China Sea, and uh, has which has been the reason for uh, instability in the Indo-Pacific. You know, this is the uh, this is primarily the maritime region where uh, all these uh, uh, all these uh, aggressive postures have been uh, uh, have been uh, observed and. Uh, a very important role is uh, the role of the United States. It is uh, militarily the strongest power in the Quad. Uh, it is also uh, the linchpin of the organization in a way that its relations with other Quad partners are very essential to understanding how the organization is uh, going to um, go ahead in future. Uh, its relations with uh, Japan have been uh, uh, great. They are allies, Japan and uh, the US, Australia and the US are allies but uh, they have had problems. The, the problem of burden sharing of the alliance of the defense that uh, is there between America and Japan has been uh, uh, problematic in between their relations. During the Trump administration, very specifically, uh, they have had uh, uh, issues uh, uh, in, in bilateral relations. But uh, as, we, as we are seeing that today is, a, is the Quad summit, there is possibility that it will bring reassurances for Japan and uh, uh, the relations would be improved. Uh, with Australia, there, are, there have been issues on, uh, there has been doubt on the, uh, uh, the nuclear deterrence, the extended nuclear deterrence by the US to Australia. There has also been uh, the, the skepticism on the, on the role of asymmetric uh, partnership uh, with the US. So a lot of uh, uh, people in the strategic community of Australia would not have raised objections on that. And uh, with India, uh, the US has had a unique relationship. Uh, during the Cold War, it was uh, not uh, very friendly. And uh, from then we have come to the milestone of the US, uh, uh, India-US nuclear deal, which has uh, been a very uh, turning uh, milestone for our bilateral relations. And uh, uh, today we have a very good understanding. And uh, uh, PM Modi is in Washington DC today. And they hopefully uh, the, the two sides talk about issues that could uh, lead uh, to uh, re reducing any kind of friction that may arise in the bilateral relations. And, uh, and all the core partners uh, would uh, uh, hopefully interact to, uh, to uh, do away with the intra-group disagreements that they may have. Uh, I had talked about the US military presence in the Indo-Pacific earlier. US has had allies in the region for a very long time, uh, which is why it is a very formidable power in the Indo-Pacific and the main counter to uh, China's uh, aggressive rise. And uh, uh, this is uh, a, a picture which preliminary sh shows uh, what kind of countries have been cooperating with the US where it has, uh, uh, where it has complete allies and where it has uh, uh, countries that only cooperate, you can see that India is not an ally, uh, unlike uh, Australia and uh, Japan. And uh, China's gray zone tactics have been the concern for all court partners, and uh, more so for uh, uh, India, Australia, and Japan, because they have faced uh, problems uh, with China, the Galwan Valley clashes, or the Singapu Islands dispute, or uh, the economic sanctions on, on Australia have been all characterized as gray zone operations of varying degrees. So in gray zone operations, uh, the power, the assertive power, China does not want war with another country, but tries uh, these gray zone operations so as to instigate uh, the, the atmosphere of security in the region and try to have strategic gains in the, in the bilateral equations, which is what China has been doing very, in a very well articulated gray zone operations. Uh, it has also used cyber attacks against its adversaries. The attack on the power grid in India, uh, cyber attacks in, uh, in, uh, uh, in other countries that it has uh, uh, committed are, are all part of gray zone operations that it has uh, continuously uh, run against other countries. Uh, this is a map of, uh, you would have already seen uh, these uh, uh, maps. So I would just rush through them. This is the Galwan Valley where the conflict happened. Uh, hot Springs, Gobra Hot Springs, and Pangong Lake. This is the Singapore Island dispute uh, uh, map, where, which is between Japan and China. Uh, essentially, uh, the, 
the uh, dispute in boundary of the maritime region. Uh, it, there has been an uncertainty uh, regarding how the Quad would proceed. The Quad leaders do not want to be viewed as a NATO-like alliance. It is not only limited to military. So what they would uh, 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 instead do is uh, establish Quad as, as a larger umbrella of, of a security alliance, which includes non-traditional areas, which is why we had working groups on vaccine and climate change from the first summit that we had in March. So Quad is, is uh, uh, it is not going to be directed at anybody, but it will uh, try to set uh, a multipolarity in the Indo-Pacific region. And it would include a lot of areas such as climate change, which is uh, going to be a, a very significant problem for the Indo-Pacific in the coming time in its, uh, in its umbrella of areas that it would uh, very closely look at. Uh, one very key area is also the supply chains. So the countries in Quad and uh, the other countries who have been associated with these Quad partners would ideally want to restructure the supply chains so that they are not uh, uh, overtly dependent on China for, for essential items. So uh, that is, uh, oh, there is this picture that I wanted to show. Uh, it, sh it shows how in intermediate items, this is from Bloomberg, uh, how dependent we have been on China. You can see that India is also pretty much uh, uh, dependent on China and the US is uh, to a large extent, to 35%, that is, that is a large amount. And uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, times such as the pandemic, it becomes uh, very crucial for a country to sustain by itself. And uh, I think which is why the court has become all the more important, all the more relevant because they would want to restructure the supply chains. So at least the countries would have control on the manufacture of essential items. And the, the trade and supplies would not be uh, controlled by one country alone. So that is also one very major objective of the Quad. China in the neighborhood, obviously China wants to control the South China Sea. Uh, I, would, uh, I would want to cite uh, uh, Robert Kaplan who has in his book, Asia's Cauldron, explained how uh, Caribbean was to the US is how South China Sea is to China. It is a very essential region. Apart from all the minerals and resources that it might have, it has a very uh, core logistical importance because uh, uh, China, which is a growing economy and uh, it needs uh, a continuous supply of oil, uh, all of this uh, uh, oil and resources, a uh, large amount of trade passes through straits in South China Sea. Uh, and it's, it's the immediate neighborhood of China. So obviously any rising superpower would want to have complete control in that area. The problem here is that it overlaps with so many other Southeast Asian nations, which have uh, uh, laid claim in the, in the maritime areas of South China Sea, which has made it a very intense conflict issue. Akash, are we winding up? <laughs> yes, yes, very, uh, very shortly. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, your uh, slides are pretty explanatory, self-explanatory, yes. so yes. you can just go for it. Sure, sure, yes. This is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the straits uh, in, in South China Sea and the future of the Quad, China is going to constantly undermine. It has uh, already said that uh, the Quad has cold war mentality and we should grow out of it. But for the Quad partners, it is very essential that they work to retain the cohesiveness of Quad because a lot of other security arrangements will also emerge in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, given the kind of security atmosphere that we have now, uh, India, France, uh, Australia, trilateral, the AUKUS that we have seen uh, very recently in a, in a very secret kind of uh, deal. So these kind of arrangements are going to appear, but uh, Quad partners would have to sustain the, the focus on, on Quad uh, because the geography dictates that it would uh, stay relevant for, uh, for a long period of the coming time. One very uh, good way is to establish formal mechanisms of engagement in Quad on levels such as military, technology, cybersecurity, and environment. And uh, different state agencies must be involved on one-to-one, one-on-one, -one, one -on -one, so that uh, this cooperation is not dependent only on the political uh, uh, part of the equation. Uh, we have talked pretty much about uh, these things. Uh, Quad must engage with the many laterals. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific, these groupings that are going to emerge so that it does not have any uh, uh, conflict of interest. This is a, a, 
Akash, I have to request you to wind up. Akash? We'll have to leave for another meeting. Okay, we are losing your voice now. And um, Akash, I wish the COD leadership was there to listen to all the suggestions you have because you practically have a role model that you've built. Is uh, uh, Aditi Priya here? Okay, in which case I'll request Sarabjit Kaur to please make a presentation and, uh, you know, look at, she's looking at uh, uh, nuclear, non nuclear proliferation and its effect on the security environment in East Asia. So, uh, yes, Sarabjit, all yours. Thank you so much, ma'am. So needless sure. to say, if you can do within 12 to 13 minutes, would be great. Sure, ma'am. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible. Uh, put it on the uh, full screen mode. Yeah. yeah. So I'll start by quoting the famous uh, Japanese uh, philosopher Daisaku Ikeda. So long as uh, he says, and I quote, so long as nuclear weapons continue to exist, so will the temptation to threaten others with overwhelming military force. Unquote. Uh, with increasing number of countries uh, planning to build their nuclear arsenals, nuclear proliferation has emerged as the main concern of the 21st century. When an isolated country like North Korea is committed to expanding its nuclear program, it poses a direct threat to the security of not only the Northeast Asian region, but also the world at large. Good morning, everyone. I, Sarabji. Uh, the topic of my today's presentation is North Korea's nuclear proliferation effects on the security environment in East Asia. First of all, I would like to thank our esteemed professors uh, uh, and uh, faculties uh, for especially pulling in brilliant minds in this three days online conference. So in the next 10 minutes, uh, I am going to give you brief uh, background of the Juche ideology, North Korea's nuclear quest, uh, the involvement of the major parties and uh, six parties uh, in the region, security of the Northeast Asian region, and my concluding remarks. Firstly, I would like to give you uh, an overview of uh, Juche ideology. Jushi ideology was uh, founded by President Kim Il-sung in 1948. According to North Korean professor... Uh, Sarabjit, I don't know if you have a PowerPoint presentation, but it has moved beyond your title slide. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, Jushi ideology was uh, founded by President Kim Il-sung in 1948. According to North Korean professor Dai Suk, he says that North Korean worldview is rooted in the experience of North Korean people and is basically the effect of North Korean, uh, Korean effort to be self-reliant and a reaction to their past political subjugation, economic dependence upon Soviet Union and China. So since its inception, uh, Jushi had played an important role in North Korea's uh, policy making. Considering the crucial experience before and after the Korean War, North Korean view became anti-imperialistic and anti-American. To begin with, Kim Il-sung and his guerrillas had been fighting with Japanese troops for almost 15 years and yet had lost every battle. And they were forced to seek uh, security protection from the uh, Soviet Far East during the later part of the Second World War. Further, the U.S. military intervention in the Korean uh, Civil War, which was unforeseen, the mass landing of the U.S. Marines at Incheon in September 1950s were a uh, surprise. So the war which was started by North Korea by crossing the 38th parallel, invading the South Korea, had repercussions when the U.S. carpet bombarded the uh, North Korean territory for three years. Uh, further, the collapse of Soviet Union in the 90s, uh, which served as an uh, uh, ally of North Korea, 
normalize relations with South Korea post the Cold War. Secondly, with the opening of market economy, China established uh, diplomatic relations with South and repudiating its entrenched relations with North in the process. Thus, from 1989 to 92, North Korea was left isolated and uh, diplomatically secluded from the Soviet Union uh, and China when uh, Soviet Union and China started normalizing its relations with South Korea. So North faced economic and energy decline as a result of suspended Soviet and Chinese oil supplies, food shortages, and lack of foreign exchange. So the idea behind Juche was to remind Korean people of the constant threat that was uh, posed by the imperialist power and the necessity of the strong dramatic, uh, dramatic actions that could be taken in uh, response. So when Kim um, Il-sung passed away in 94, it initiated a new era of Juche politics, focusing primarily on the military elevation and in 98, the development of the idea of Tangsung uh, Daeguk, which means a great and powerful state, ensured national security, uh, became the center stage and put a strong emphasis on uh, military related matters. And Tangsung Daeguk uh, transformed the Juche thought to fit in the international order. So moving to the uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear zeal and diplomacy, North Korea's persistence on the development of nuclear weapons began in the mid 1950s following the threats of uh, threats from the United States. In order to facilitate cooperation in the field of nuclear science, Pyongyang signed agreement with Soviet Union and China in 1956 and 1959, respectively. And uh, following that, uh, Pyongyang sent its nuclear scientists uh, for nuclear training at the Chinese research uh, nuclear facilities. So uh, Pyongyang also received two megawatt uh, research reactor from Soviet Union in 1965, which became operational in 1967, uh, uh, following which uh, Pyongyang signed an agreement uh, with the International Agency, uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency in 1977, which provided a mechanism by which its uh, two megawatt research uh, reactor could be monitored. So backed by the nuclear aid of Russia and China, Pyongyang uh, thrived in its nuclear program. However, the scenario post 90s changed when Soviet Union established uh, relations with the Republic of Korea. The US then emerged as the substitute to the roles played by the former allies, uh, Soviet Union and China. And in 91, the two Koreas agreed for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and concluded a North-South agreement for reconciliation and uh, non-aggression. So nonetheless, uh, North Korea's persistent quest for nuclear uh, weapons threatened these two agreements. Uh, and North Korea announced uh, its intention to withdraw from nuclear non-proliferation treaty in 1993. And it was during this time that Clinton administration direct involvement began and gave an unofficial commitment to Pyongyang for economic aid and diplomatic normalization if North Korea would improve its behavior. So in 94, US and North Korea finally reached um, an agreement to freeze uh, Pyongyang's nuclear weapons. The agreement, which was uh, known as a Great Framework, uh, was signed in Geneva, provided that Pyongyang froze its nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear program, and pledged to comply with International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards and uh, inspections, and eventually to dismantle its nuclear uh, uh, re uh, reactors. So in return, U.S. promised uh, the North Korean government that it would arrange for the transfer of 1,000 megawatt uh, uh, light uh, megawatt uh, light, uh, light water reactors by the year 2003. Soon uh, in 96, North Korea uh, troops staged military exercise in the area of uh, 
demilitarized zone and the exercise was followed by Pyongyang's announcement that it would no longer fulfill its duties concerning the maintenance of uh, maintaining and control of demilitarized zone, alleging that South Korea had violated the armistice uh, uh, by deploying weapons there. So armistice is the agreement signed in 1953, which formally ended the Korean War. So Pyongyang tested its first uh, nuclear missile in 1998. Under the leadership of Kim uh, Jong Il, and the missile was the first uh, multi-stage rocket Taipo Dong One that crossed the Japanese airspace. Following the uh, missile test, the talks between the U.S. and North reached the diplomatic impasse. So, despite the promise of a freeze under the 94 agreed framework, the North Korea retained its nuclear program. So, moving on to the six party talks bush administration uh, confronted so when bush administration confronted north korea uh, questioning its nuclear program in 2002 it eventually led to the withdrawal of north korea from npt uh, marking the collapse of agreed framework in 2003 intending to put uh, to uh, to halt the North Korea's nuclear program, uh, six party talks were initiated, which uh, earlier involved US, no North Korea, and China, which was uh, trilateral talks. It became multilateral talks when uh, Japan, South Korea, and Russia were involved. So six party talks prospered when in 2005, parties became signatory to an agreement called September 19 Joint Statement in which North Korea committed to abandon its nuclear program and return to NPD in exchange for food and, uh, food and energy assistance. However, a series of obstacles hindered uh, the implementation of the agreement. In July 2006, Pyongyang tested missiles, uh, ballistic missiles over the Sea of Japan and staged an underground nuclear test in October. So in May 2009, Pyongyang eventually walked out of the six-party talks in which six countries had held six rounds of negotiations for over the period of six years. So when North Korea tested another nuclear missiles in the late 2012 and early 2013, that pushed Russia to bring Pyongyang back to the negoci uh, negotiating table. So six-party talk is a fundamental pillar for the international engagements with North Korea. Many experts believe that diplomacy could be effective solution to the North Korean uh, nuclear issue and often cite 94 agreed framework to um, uh, abandon its nuclear program. So when uh, North Korea exploded underground uh, hydrogen bomb in 2017, Trump warned North Korea that any threat to use no uh, nuclear bombs against US and its allies, it will be dealt with massive response. And while Washington uh, devised a series of military strikes against Pyongyang during this time, China was reluctant to take steps that might lead to collapse of the North Korean regime. Uh, China has maintained a very uh, clear position on uh, North Korea's nuclear uh, program that North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons cannot be tolerated and North Korean nuclear crisis should be resolved by peaceful means. And China's effort to protect North Korean uh, political stability ended up resulting in the strengthening of relationship amongst US, Japan and South Korea. Coming to the security of the uh, region, uh, security of the Sarabh North. Sarabhji, uh, why don't you come to the contemporary context and kind of conclude so that sure. we take the rest in the, you know, in the Q&A. Sure, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Okay. So uh, coming to the security of the Northeast Asian region, which is of utmost importance, region be, uh, reason being it includes the three major powers in the region, uh, which is China, Japan, and Russia. Uh, not being geographically located, U.S. played a very crucial role since uh, it was involved in the World War and has a major influence in the security and politics of the Northeast Asian region. Secondly, 
the concentrated with major powers northeast asian region has been brimful with conflicts in the past such as uh, russo japanese war world war 2 and the korean war so with three countries conflict uh, Uh, with three countries armed with nuclear weapons and millions of military personnel china russia and north korea the northeastern uh, asian region is one of the most dangerous regions in the world despite the region's potential for open conflict there is uh, not been any meaningful multilateral security cooperation among them so uh, north korea steadily growing nuclear arsenal could also trigger the domino effect in the east asian uh, East Asia, if tensions broke out, uh, so when a nuclear test conducted by North uh, could also spur Japan to obtain weapons of its own. Uh, many in Japan perceive North Korea as posing a threat, and this would likely fuel Japanese op- opinion favoring an independent nuclear capability. Nuclear armed North Korea might also spur ambitions in uh, South Korea and. Uh, Taiwan governments in both South Korea and Taiwan have demonstrated nuclear ambitions in the past which were ultimately restrained by the direct and inter- US interventions so um i i think i'll uh, just conclude uh, here uh, as we are already uh, short of time So North Korea's uh, previously neglected numerous agreements uh, in which a promise to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula was the main agenda of the parties involved. Threatened by the nuclear uh, armed US which is driving force behind the nuclear motivations of North Korea, North has defended its nuclear program. And so sorry Saram ji another reminder uh, you well passed your time. Ma'am so just give me can... Thirty seconds to just finish it off. Please, please. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, threatened by the nuclear armed US, which is the driving force behind the nuclear motivations of North Korea, the North has defended its nuclear program, convinced of its serving as defense strategy for regime. While many believe that nuclear program is to accumulate power in the region and beyond, and North Korea's nuclear program poses a huge threat to the regional security of the Northeast Asian region. Thank you so much. Um, I'll stop sharing my slide. Thank you, Sir Jit. You took us through history entirely, and I'm sure you'll have to contextualize that with a Q and A. Sure. Especially, ma'am. I mean, just adding on to this, especially in terms of China's high moral ground, you know, in kind of dictating um, uh, Korea. So somewhere you need to look at that perspective. But sure. I want to invite. Our uh, last, but certainly not the least, speaker is she there? Aditi Priya. Aditi Priya. Priya. Ma'am, right now I cannot see her in the list. Earlier she was visible, so I think. Do you want to give her a call? Ma'am, I did try, but her and number. Meena, let's in. let's start with the questions, and in case she comes in the next five minutes, we'll see if we can accommodate her. Yeah, and right. we have some questions already in the Q and A uh, by Tekraj uh, Koirala, who says, "Thank you, Nimesh. Is this is addressed to Nimesh uh, for your presentation on the possible impact of, of IA in Asia Pacific region? I have one question: How the global power, mainly between China and US rivalry, could unfold in Asia Pacific region regarding IA, and how can China counter the alliance led by US?" to achieve supremacy in ia for power projection in asia pacific that's a whole book but we want your answer in uh, within the one minute or so and now nilesh pandey asked sarabjit kaur uh, is what options do we have left dealing with north korea uh, better more defensive weapons increase uh, increased presence by china talks with north korea or business as usual what is the likelihood of north korea selling nuclear weapons or technologies to others is that a threat that might uh, be a beginning of a new bargaining chip basically and then we have a third question by shruti who says china opposes shruti saxena says china opposes india's nsg bid uh, says signing N- npt is mandatory also china is one of the five permanent members of the unsc 
and has been using its veto power to block India's effort to become a permanent member of the body. Why is it important for India to be part of NSG and UN, uh, UNSC? This is something which any of you can answer, but specifically China specific uh, would also do. So we would have that. Then we have a couple of in the chat where somebody has put in a question for uh, Nimesh again. I think it's the same question that's been repeated, but uh, how has the global power mainly between China and US rivalry, uh, how will it unfold in Asia Pacific region regarding AI and how can China counter this alliance led by it? Also uh, at a general level, uh, since we have some time now that Aditi Priya hasn't joined, I would like if you have left out anything in terms of a conclusive thing, all the speakers timed 60 seconds if you can, you know, give us a concluding bit so that, you know, we don't go away, you don't go away feeling that you haven't been able to project what you were meant to do. And basically from the concern beyond the pure security concerns, I could see Sanya having a lot of questions when others are presenting. So please go ahead. I mean, you can ask each other as well. That's in fact, that's the great thing. If we can do the, have the panelists speak to each other. Uh, so that, that whole context of the changing security perspective and how, uh, do you place whatever your area of concern in that perspective and the significance of uh, Asia Pacific in this region and being, you know, sandwiched between all these powers that we are looking at. So uh, maybe Nimesh, we can start with you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. So thank you, Tekras, for the question. So particularly in the Asia Pacific region, a great deal of competition between the United States and China. So uh, like a recent uh, uh, alliance of AUKUS is also an example to counter China and Quad has already been in place. And I wouldn't be any surprised that the United States will make a new alliance with any other ASEAN uh, nations or, uh, or other countries in the region like South Korea and all. So how would uh, China catch up with the United States and uh, rival that of the um, uh, United States? Uh, that is a very pertinent question and the Chinese government has been working hard to be relevant in regard to internet, uh, artificial intelligence. They have prepared a plan uh, through which they will become superpower by 2030. Uh, we can see the global research paper in terms of in the field of AI, China leads the United States. Uh, in terms of filling the patterns, uh, China comes second only to the United States. Uh, China also lacks... Uh, in the uh, AI form than that of the United States, but uh, China has a great deal of advantage in terms of uh, data, which means uh, there are many internet users and there is no data privacy issue in China. Government and other private companies can collect data as they like. So uh, China has particularly advantage on that. Uh, to conclude my statement, uh, uh, I'll tell that uh, there is no any doubt that United States has a significant advantage in terms of AI and they can present more power in the Asia Pacific region as of now, but uh, looking at the determination uh, that China has and uh, the United States seems to be kind of uh, in, uh, not in decline exactly, but uh, like the decrease in the pace of it, I think China will utilize its uh, AI potential to become um, uh, meaningful in terms of economy and security fronts in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think uh, Sarabjit had some questions. Why don't you go for it? You've been the last. In fact, there's an, an additional question here I can see on North Korea. Uh, what can be ne India's role? Uh, Utkarsh Kapoor is asking this. To host and any of the panelists, India's role in nuclear disarmament of, Korean, of the Korean Peninsula. So others who haven't answered could well answer this as well. Uh, so... Um... Just a moment. Is that Sarabjit? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, thank you, Nitish, for asking that question. Uh, I would like to say that in the present geopolitical churn, uh, North Korea would definitely uh, like to draw Russia into the complex scheme and the competition of the great powers. This would uh, definitely allow Pyongyang to use Russia as a counterbalance uh, to both US and China, as well as the possibly, uh, as well as uh, possibly South Korea and uh, Japan. Uh, 
So, uh, like presently, uh, it can be clearly seen that Kim uh, Jong Un does not intend to give up its nuclear weapons, nor reform uh, North Korea's political system. It is hard to see how Washington could embrace a new uh, nuclear armed uh, North Korea. Uh, unlike uh, the former uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, uh, whose administration sought the final and fully verified de uh, denuclearization of the uh, North Korea, the new formulation or uh, on simply prefixes the term with addition of complete denuclearization of the North Korea. So uh, it's it's very interesting to see how the Biden administration is going to take over uh, this. Uh, the role as a major player in the region. Also, uh, the next question, which says uh, India's role, uh, India is very critic of uh, North, uh, North nuclear proliferation and has definitely voiced its concern for denuclearization and disarmament of North Korea's nuclear uh, uh, proliferation. Uh, if others have answer to this, better answer for the India's role, uh, I would request they can uh, have their. Uh... Thank you. Thank you, Sarabjit. Thank you. I want you. to really appreciate all the papers, starting with Nimesh, because the power dynamics have been discussed from myriad dimensions and the ch exponentially changing dynamics, which are, which are just so, it's just so dynamic, including the cord and, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the inevitability of some things and in, and including the other side, uh, one doesn't know. There are lots of surprises in store as well. Uh, Sanya gave a very, very succinct presentation on, uh, you know, that looking at this whole perspective of, uh, uh, you know, uh, China-Pakistan equation. And I think went way beyond that, looking at other complexions. So maybe the title was not quite right. I'm not sure. And implications on the entire region. Of course, she focused on the South Asian region in a lot of ways. So that was, um, you know, very, very, very succinct, I would have thought. Uh, and uh, uh, Swati, who was the third presenter, I was very uh, taken in by the cluttered space concept. We look at spaces in various ways. And the fact that there's so many interventions and the dynamic within the space. So if you want to elaborate a little bit on that would be great as well in terms of, uh, you know, US's supremacy in space followed by China, you know, which is kind of fighting for that global dominance on that quarter and that entire space industry, maybe even military industrial complex and others. So just a conclusive statement on that would help. Uh, Jyotish Man, I thought you build on a lot of factors very, very succinctly and your slides were there, your voice volume was not great. So somewhere I'm intrigued, why did you put geographical uh, dimension as a separate factor along with economic and diplomatic oblique political? And then you spoke about population and geography again. So why a separate uh, manifestation? Is that because space is so multidimensional that you wanted to mention it in that way? So I'd like to ask you that. Uh, Akash Sahu, I thought, you know, that whole uh, dynamic of the pandemic that you got in, which is something because you did mention that climate change and others are the most significant kind of dimensions which needed to be, is Akash here? Okay, I, I don't think Akash is here, but nonetheless, in case he's here, uh, the impact of, uh, of coronavirus, which he spoke about the dependence of China on a lot of quarters, but the impact of coronavirus on China itself and the world that, you know, we could kind of put in perspective here. Uh, I think Sarabjit has been asked a lot of questions, but uh, if you want to, um, if any of you, I would want all of you to make like a one minute conclusive statement on what we want to go ahead with. So Sanya, certainly, because yours was so exhaustive, you've taken up a whole lot of quarters, you know, and on, on a lot of ways. And I love the comparison between with Mao that you <laughs> drew on, uh, you know, in the Chinese uh, uh, context and the fact that they are different. So I want you to expand on how, what is the difference and what is, how do we contemporarize that? Is that because it's contemporary times? And how do we use that difference? How do we, as in 
anything beyond China use that experience. So maybe we'll start with uh, Nimesh has, I think, uh, had a few questions. So we'll start with Sanya. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, actually, I found it also very interesting that uh, even though the political vision of Mao is very similar to President Xi in terms that both actually are looking for a very nationalistic uh, version of China, and both are looking to make China great again, something that is not uh, a very new slogan when we see the Trump administration here in the United States. Uh, what I found was strikingly uh, different was how President Xi has been trying to use economic corridor as the strength of reaching out to uh, the other regions of the world. And that transnational corridor uh, is something which is very important to China right now. So when we're talking about transnational corridor, it is, as I said, it's, it's the way you want to look at it. It's people who want to talk only about economic perspective and see how much investment it is bringing in. Some really want to see how energy uh, deprived regions like landlocked countries are actually benefiting from that uh, uh, economic corridor. I see that it is very comprehensive. Uh, it is energy corridor. It's an in investment corridor. Uh, it is political influence that China is going to exert through that uh, uh, making uh, more allies in the regions that it starts from Pakistan, which is a very uh, strong ally, but also that Pakistan is going to be now on the forefront for China. Uh, and then we have uh, Saudi Arabia, and then it goes all the way up uh, in, in Africa and in the Europe. And this is where it is different from Mao because he was not, uh, Xi is not only interested in localized conflicts, uh, and, and communist vision of how to expand China militarily. He's more interested to create and cater more allies in the political military uh, context. Uh, yes, when capabilities are there, uh, the intentions can change overnight, uh, but that is the time that I, as, as a political scientist, see is little far off. I believe China is not ready to put up uh, with any confrontation with West uh, and the China-Pakistan bloc is uh, relatively weaker uh, in terms of Indo-Pacific. Uh, so that is the time, that is the power uh, capabilities differential. And given that uh, asymmetry, I see that uh, Xi is trying to build up, but that will take years to come uh, in, in the future. Thank you, thank you, Sana. You did mention that it's not China, but US's patience is running thin. <laughs> And uh, uh, I, I found you very sympathetic towards China in some ways, you know, when you were making statements like that. But it's interesting that you concluded in the way that you did. Thank you. Swati, would you like to elaborate on how cluttered the spaces are and in within one minute? Are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Okay, so when I, um, so space is cluttered, fine. So this is actually from where everything starts as to why. Sorry, and sorry, I, I do want you to put that in the perspective of what you mentioned was US supremacy of the spaces followed by China in some senses. And uh, what are the strategies in terms of, you know, learning that you could have for others to take on these, uh, mastering these spaces, these okay. dynamics? Okay, all right. So um, thank you. So basically, the fact that space, the outer space is getting more and more cluttered. Is Your closer. volume is still not great. Okay, I, I will speak louder. So the fact that the outer space is getting more and more cluttered is uh, throwing new challenges you know, to human life on Earth and the space-faring nations. So there are not so many space-faring nations right now, but India happens to be one. And apart from India, you know, we have the, the, the other major powers of the world like US, Russia, China you know, etc. Japan, Australia, who are there in the space. So uh, the fact I said that space is cluttered, not just uh, in terms of the number of space-faring nations that is rising, but also because there are private entities who are entering space, okay? And then uh, I said the space is getting cluttered because, uh, uh, you know, of not only these two reasons, but also because China is kind of pursuing a very feverish uh, engagement with space. And lastly, uh, space is not just, uh, you know, there for the you know security and strategic uh, competition, but also because it is mustering. Uh, there has been a mustering of space industries to the tune of about three hundred billion three hundred billion US dollars. So all of this kind of makes space a very cluttered concept. And then, uh, with respect to what you asked about, uh, you know, what are the uh, what are the ways in which we should be looking at uh, 
sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, basically uh, our engagement towards space. Okay, so uh, one important thing that I could not cover in my presentation because of paucity of time was that earlier India's space program was what was referred to as space 1.0 which basically means that, you know, it was a binary. Space 1.0 meant something like, uh, you know, technology which was not really hybrid. And the kind of space intervention and space uh, engagement that we are entering now uh, is more and more focusing on hybrid technologies, okay, in space. So uh, for that, uh, you know, the argument of the paper was that, uh, you know, we see a kind of a quad-like cooperation to emerge in space why? Because the International Space Station is aging and by 2028 it is about to get redundant. So uh, with the existing space faring nations, we are likely to see a kind of a quad like uh, you know, cooperation. And then I went on to show how uh, you know, Indian space, ISRO and NASA are collaborating, ISRO and JAXA, which is Japanese space agencies collaborating, and similarly ISRO and ASA, which is Australian. Okay. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that is what. Thank you. Uh, Jyotir, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah. You're a little better audible than Swati. Swati, your volume was, you know, one really had to strain. Yeah, please. Okay. So the reason why I uh, mentioned geography separately is because if you look at the uh, geography of uh, India and Indonesia, I mean, especially Indonesia, the reason why I actually included Indonesia is primarily because of the geographical, uh, you know, determinant. Uh, so Indonesia, uh, it, it actually sits um, um, directly over four important straits, which connects the Indian Ocean, which connects the South, Ch South China Sea to the Indian Ocean. That is the Strait of Malacca, uh, Lombok, Umbaiveta, and Sunda. Now, if you look at the depth of those straits, then that gives a very interesting uh, you know, uh, point. Uh, so Malacca Strait is actually quite narrow. Similar, same goes for uh, you know, uh, 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 Sunda Strait as well. So if any, if any Chinese military vessel has to actually come to the Indian Ocean, it has to come through, uh, through the uh, Lombok Strait or the Umbaveta Strait. Now that makes it very interesting because if you, in case of a conflict, you can actually leverage those straits uh, by having good ties, of course, with Indonesia. And then you can actually monitor those, uh, monitor Chinese, um, you know, submarines or naval ships coming through that, coming through those points. And the same goes for commercial ships as well. Because as, as I mentioned, 90% uh, of oil actually passes through, 90% uh, 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 of uh, uh, oil imports from China actually passes through this region, from the Gulf of Aden uh, to the Straits of, uh, through the Straits of Malacca to, uh, to the South China Sea. Now India has, India, in the geography of India actually gives it uh, the, uh, the leverage to actually directly overlook the Indian Ocean. And also it is a very strong, it, is a, it, is, it has arguably one of the strongest Navy in the Indian Ocean region. And there's a reason why, uh, why India is actually building a set of naval stations, uh, um, um, uh, radar stations in islands like Sri Lanka, uh, Maldives, Lakshadweep. You know, the, the, the purpose of this is to monitor those ships coming. And India also has an information fusion center in Gurgaon, where it also hosts uh, naval personnel from other countries as well. The purpose behind it is to monitor those Chinese ships, naval as well as commercial, to have, to have a better understanding so that in case of a war, you can actually know the location of those Chinese military ships, or if you, or you can also, you know, uh, blockade the commercial ships that are passing through those regions. And there is, a, in fact, another uh, new thing that is, I mean, I think it's already on work. Uh, there is a fish hook system of the U.S. Navy, which was until up to uh, Philippines or Vietnam. Now it has been, now it is being extended to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands through the state of Malacca. So that any commercial ships passing through those regions, or if any submarine passes through those regions, you get, uh, you know, or you get a warning, or you get, you know, the, those radars. A fish hook system is basically underwater naval, uh, you know, sonar boys that are that are underwater, which can actually detect any ships, any vessel that is passing through them. So that okay. is why geography is a very important factor. Why, and that is why I mentioned it, very, you know, separately from the rest of the factors. So you mentioned geographical advantage and then you mentioned geography and population are separate that's all thank you thank you jyotishman uh, and of course we're running out of time so akash would you like to uh, make a uh, like a conclusive statement akash sahu so i think we are done i think we had amazing you know strands 
and multifaceted kind of you know dimensions that covered that were covered the global dial in fact has shifted towards more comprehensive understanding of security in various ways and i think a lot of these were dealt with by all of you and especially the non uh, traditional security threats so i really really appreciate amity for taking forward something which is so dynamic and bringing this to the fore and getting such uh, astonishing scholars who have a reading of everything so i, I really wish akash for instance was able to advise the cord leadership who's there and uh, nimesh to give a perspective on it and sanya to have her take on it because this is the kind of thing that you know we attribute to think tanks and we take that forth but this is coming from um, you know from within the educational institutions so very very significant and this shift really highlights the experiences of different individuals and communities in lots of ways from civilians affected by war to irregular migrants to moving to another space so really a lot of things were touched uh, though not exhaustively but a lot of things were touched in terms of climate change in terms of coronavirus beyond the non traditional security so uh, i'd like to thank uh, dr nagalakshmi divya that whole team of amity uh, professor bindra and the whole team of amity for taking this you know to another level and i don't want to eat into the further into the time that you know i think you have your validity session next and so don't want to eat into the time so thank you all the speakers i think you can build on your papers amazingly and maybe they are they are going to think of doing some publication so they'll get back on that quarter thank you all thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, well uh, organized and uh, you have kept the time so well also and yes of course all the speakers were uh, all the presenters were also too good and yes tidbits of course they are in the learning uh, uh, stage so they will be learning the same of course so they can do the necessary uh, the, the whatever the guidance that you got you can do the necessary changes when you finally submit for the publication thank you so much ma'am uh, that was really a wonderful session thank so, you thank you and all the best and congratulations for organizing it thank you and uh, i would like to uh, forward this uh, session for a formal thanks from my anchor sorry i forgot to thank ria for anchoring as well go on <laughs> thank yeah. you ma'am thanks a lot uh, ria go ahead and uh, please uh, give a formal vote of thanks to all the presenters yes. and the of course our dynamic chair so um thank you to the chair and the presenters for an enlightening session that has enabled us especially the students of uh, AIIS with a greater understanding on the theme Asia Pacific and security perspective thank you all once again we will now move on to the plenary session 3 of the e conference after a short break of 15 minutes <laughs>